to our ongoing study of Matthew, I was thinking that we're, we're a little bit out of sync with Thanks. Out of sync with uh, liturgical life because next week we have the entry into Jerusalem, <laughs> so we have a time lag. But uh, tonight, at least, we're still in part of the gospel that's moving toward Jerusalem. We had talked last time about the fact that once we get into chapter 16 of Matthew, it sort of parallels uh, chapter 8 of Mark. Uh, there's this turning point in the gospel uh, where uh, Jesus, in a sense, sets his face towards Jerusalem, as Luke puts it. Uh, and we have the beginning of the Passion Predictions, orienting uh, the hearer of the gospel uh, to that dramatic conclusion that's still looming ahead of us within the world of Matthew's narrative. And we also see the focus moving to uh, discipleship instruction. As we know, the leaders and the uh, crowds are, are present, but there is increasing focus on Jesus' interaction with the disciples, and it's in this section of the gospel that some of the most uh, intense and rigorous uh, teaching about discipleship occurs. And what we're focus on, focusing on tonight is really a very uh, special uh, characteristic uh, text of Matthew in chapter 18 as we're coming to uh, another one of the discourses, the fourth discourse that we've encountered, Sermon on the Mount and the Mission Discourse, the Parable Discourse, and now what's called the Community Discourse, not by the Gospel itself, but by commentators over the centuries. And I thought it was also a chance, and I've tried to reflect that on the notes and will at least be able to scan these uh, at this point in our study to, uh, to step back and think about uh, Matthew's vision of the Christian community. Uh, Matthew's been characterized uh, correctly, I think, as the ecclesial gospel, not only because he uses the term ecclesia, uh, but there really is a concern both about, you might say, the ethics uh, of the community, the leadership of the community, the kind of tone uh, that the community has, the mission of the community. And, and so I try to put together for myself, for you, uh, in the second segment uh, of our, our session tonight, this sort of try to accumulate in descriptive phrases from Matthew, what, what is the vision of the church that he presents to us uh, through the medium of the gospel? But we begin with what is really very much at the heart of that vision, and that is the community discourse of chapter 18. It takes its cue from a, a passage in Mark. We remember Matthew at this point is following pretty closely, very closely, the sequence of events uh, in Mark's gospel. And when you come in Mark to the second passion prediction, in chapter nine, uh, the second of the three. You have this typical pattern in Mark that after Jesus speaks about his upcoming passion and resurrection, uh, there comes uh, on the part of the disciples a kind of misunderstanding, miscalculation, uh, discordance, uh, Peter trying to silence him. And here in Mark's text, it says Jesus turns around and says to them, what were you discussing on the way? And it says that this they fell silent because they have been arguing among themselves who was the greatest, okay? So then Jesus typically again in the pattern of each of these predictions calls them together and begins to instruct them. Uh, Matthew uses that question, uh, the argument of, about greatness as an opportunity to insert this discourse material which is taken mainly from Q and then also has some of Matthew's own, uh, his own text. Uh, the other thing that uh, sort of provides a kind of introduction to this uh, discourse is what you find at the end of chapter 17, which is only found in Matthew's gospel, and that's the question of paying the temple tax. And uh, it's a very curious story, you know, with the fish, uh, 
and the, uh, the, the do you, you know, do you pay the temple tax or not? The question posed to uh, the disciples, to Peter, and Peter again emerges as a kind of spokesperson in him uh, to, uh, for the disciples. But the question that Jesus asks and sort of deflecting uh, the question about paying this tax, which was either uh, the, the temple tax levied on all Jews, male Jews, uh, you know, prior uh, to the de revolt, prior to 70. Every Jew was expected to pay, every male Jew, the half, temple ta half shekel tax for the temple. After the revolt, the Romans continued to levy the tax, but it now was a tax that supported the Capitoline temple in uh, Rome. And uh, so it became, you can understand, a, a controversial uh, tax for sure, uh, emphasizing the subjugation of the Jews to the Romans, but also posing a kind of a conscience question uh, for them. And uh, that's the background of the story. We don't really know which uh, the temple tax is being referred to here. Uh, but in any case, what is the outcome of this story without delaying on it is uh, what is said in verse 25. What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tribute? From their children or from others? And Peter says, from others. And then Jesus uh, replies, and the children are free. So he goes on to have them pay the temple tax not to be a scandal, but the assertion the children are free, the children of the kingdom are free. Uh, and that sense of the dignity uh, of the children of the kingdom, their prominence, their privileged position, uh, leads also into the question of the discourse, because uh, the disciples ask Jesus, which is a kind of turnaround of the Mark text where they're arguing about who is the greatest. Matthew turns it into a question uh, posed by Jesus, the disciples, excuse me, posing to Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Uh, one of the texts that I put uh, on your bibliography there, Raymond Brown, the churches the apostles left behind, takes up this uh, chapter in Matthew. He, each of This is a small book he did. It's a very fine book where he talks about the ecclesiology of various uh, New Testament texts. And he focuses on chapter 18 uh, in his discussion of Matthew's vision of the church. And he says the question that the disciples ask is sort of a typical human question. Who's the greatest around here? What's the pecking order? <laughs> Who do I have to really uh, look out for? So there's sort of a kind of hierarchical, I guess you could say, you know, who's on top uh, and who's on the bottom. And what the introduction on the part of Jesus takes the child and it is, and scrambles the question or turns the question on its head. Unless you change, uh, really the, it's almost the Hebrew notion of shuv, of turn around, the Greek word like turn around, and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven, much less determine who is the greatest. So it, in a sense, it, it uh, takes the question and, and changes it uh, entirely. And whoever humbles, becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The image of the child, which will also occurs a, a little bit later in Matthew in chapter 19 about receiving the children. The, the children in Greco-Roman society probably not so different from our own society, had no standing, no legal standing. So the image of the child is not of innocence here necessarily or affectionate or something like that, but it's humility. It's having no standing. Uh, it's having no legal rights uh, outside of the family context. And so here, uh, the, the paideon, the term that's used here, what's very important uh, in this discourse, there's a shift in terms uh, that goes from sometimes lost in the English translation. Uh, it starts off with paideon. Let's see, I have to get these new ones here that we have. Paideon, uh, child in uh, 
Greek, and then is going to move to the word uh, mikroi, which means little ones. And the little ones are not children. Okay? The little ones refers to vulnerability, to defenselessness, to having standing, but these are adults uh, w within the community, as we'll see. So uh, before we get to that, if you have the, the text in front of you, there's different ways that people have tried to divide uh, this text. Uh, one of the markers in it, uh, if you notice it, just we'll do this swiftly, that uh, there's a series of sayings in the first few verses that we'll take a look at. And then in verse 10, we have a parable, the parable of the lost sheep. And at the end of the parable, in verse 14, there's a statement about the will of the Father. It is not the will of the Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. And if you look towards the end of the discourse, starting in verse 21, with Peter's question, again you have a, a kind of set of sayings followed by a parable, the parable of the unforgiving servant, which is only found in Matthew's Gospel, by the way. The, the lost sheep is also parallel in Luke, as we'll note. And then it ends also in verse 35. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So there's a series of sayings, uh, a parable, and then ending with this strong assertion of the will of the heavenly Father. And, and many people have then said, well, it's like a twofold division. But what's a little complicates that, not that it's, you know, our life depends upon it, but after the parable in verse 15 and following, there's a segment, uh, verses 15 to 20, about conflicts in the community, resolving conflicts, this procedure as we know, you know, to go first, try to be reconciled, and so on. We'll take a look at that. And that seems in a way to be a kind of centerpiece uh, in this community discourse, so that uh, what I'm suggesting here as others have, that there's really a threefold structure. The first has to do with the humility and pastoral care of the community for the mikroi, for the little ones. And the second half has to do, or the third part, excuse me, has to do with forgiveness, limitless forgiveness. In between, is the question of conflict in dealing with a recalcitrant member of the community. So that's framed, that dealing with conflict is framed by this intense need for pastoral care for the one who goes astray and for limitless forgiveness, sort of putting uh, the conflict part uh, in a, a context. What, what's also important here, as I just was suggesting and put there on your text, who, who is addressed in this discourse? Is this a general uh, statement that Matthew's making in this, or is this really uh, the strong that are being addressed? And, and I really think it's the latter, uh, because the instructions are about what to do with the vulnerable, what to do with the erring brother, what to do with the person who is recalcitrant. So it's the, the leadership of the community, if you like. It's the, the, the macro, the strong. You know, you have in, in Greek, uh, you can sort of have a descending scale here. Oops, there's the, the macro, the great. Uh, Jesus will refer to this in speaking of uh, their great ones make their presence felt in speaking of authority within the community in chapter 19. And, and then you have the mikroi, you've spoken of here, and those are little ones, you know, the little people, we say in our own idiom. And then you have elakiston, lakistoi, we can say. Elakistoi is the superlative, but meaning the least, which Matthew also uses. Whatever you do to the least, you do to me. We'll see it in the parable of the sheep and the goats. So there, these are all connected. And I think in this uh, discourse, Matthew is addressing the macro in the community, the core, the disciples, the, the, the ones who are in a position 
uh, to either put obstacles in the way of the others or not. And it has some connection here with, with the meaning of these texts. So if we look at the, the content, just to drift back, I, I've often thought of this community discourse, which I think is one of the the most powerful parts of Matthew's gospel when you're thinking about ecclesiology. That in a sense what the evangelist is doing is, is an exercise that we might do, which is to say, if I were to try to enunciate, to identify the most important values or quality of relationships that make up the community of, of Christ, the Christian community, what would it be? Yeah. What sayings or parables would I put into the grab bag <laughs> to identify this? And if you think of this text this way, how interesting is the selection <laughs> of what is put here to, to sort of define the nature of our, our, our relationships within the community. And so as I mentioned, the first uh, part of it, verses one to five, like going back now, uh, is the, the call to, to sort of put aside the kind of a social reach, you know, that is often characterizes uh, a human community. And the, the necessity to sort of turn one's values uh, in a new way and to become humble, to become, uh, you know, sort of on the same plane with everybody else. And we saw this in chapter 23 of Matthew's Gospel, call no one on earth your father, call no one your leader. There's a, an egalitarian streak uh, that goes strongly through Matthew's gospel and uh, occurs here. And then this is where I think, you know, thinking of who's talking to whom in this discourse becomes interesting in the next segment, 6 to 13. And that has to do with the verb skandalon, the noun skandalon and the verb skandalizomai. Uh, Scandal on scandal, uh, you know, we can think ourselves of scandal. We have plenty of scandal to, you know, to, to deal with where there is uh, pernicious behavior that shocks us and wounds us. Uh, but what's interesting here, if you take the root word of scandal in Greek, it means obstacle. It's putting an obstacle in the way of. And, and uh, the New Revised Standard that I have here before me, I don't know what yours have, it says, if you put a stumbling block before one of the little ones, okay, uh, who believe in me, it would be better if you have a great millstone fastened around your neck and drowned in the sea of all of these very strong rhetorical uh, uh, contrasts. And so the question is, well, how does, how, how do the strong put obstacles in the way of the weak. <laughs> and, and that, you know, it could be by terrible behavior, but it also could be by excessive rigor. <laughs> it could be by despising them, as he says, don't despise the little ones. It could be attitudes that are uh, not so much that the macroi are, you know, somehow deviant or uh, immoral, it's a possibility. But I think the tone here is the leadership is not caring for the mikroi. It's despising them. It's not going after them. It's not including them. Uh, and this is the, you know, the role of leadership here is being urged to care for one of these stray. It's a different type, I think, of, of, of thinking of this. And that becomes even, uh, if you look at verse 10, after this whole series of things about better not to enter with one eye than have two eyes be thrown into the hell of fire and so on, I'll come back to this. Some think that this, these are body images reflecting the notion of the, the Christian community as a body. I think that may be a stretch here. I think you just have a, you know, typical uh, hyperbole, rhetorical hyperbole to make the point how vital it is not to put obstacles in the way of the weak. And lo look at verse 10. Take care that you do not despise one of these little ones. Uh, and, and this is very interesting. I probably told this story uh, in other settings. Forgive me if it's a repeat. Uh, 
as one of our board members said, his father used to say to him, did I tell you this story today? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, but uh, Raymond Williams, who was a great teacher, uh, he's retired now, but at Wabash College, and he was, uh, CTU was part of a process that the Lilly Endowment had some years ago with different faculties come together to talk about the pedagogy and so on. And uh, we were all at different tables, and Raymond Williams, who was a very gentle but uh, soul, but a strong person, uh, was sort of moving around. He was moderating the, the uh, discussion, and he came back, and he sort of, you know, people were giving feedback, and he said, may I make an observation, you know? He said, I, I was moving around the tables, and one, I heard a lot of wonderful uh, comments, he said, but one recurring theme was that uh, faculty were speaking disparagingly of their students. <laughs> you know, that they weren't up to this, they couldn't write you know, all the kind of stuff that has been said for centuries. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he, he said, you know, one thing I'm convinced of, a, a teacher can never despise his students. <laughs> And, you know, I think that that's, you know, there's something very fundamental. A pastor can't despise his people. And here, this is what leads me to think that the problem with the McRoy is not that they're doing something, something immoral, <laughs> scandal in that sense, but they're, they're treating the, uh, the McRoy with contempt. <laughs> they're insignificant. They're not to be taken care of. And what's beautiful about this text in verse 10, that it's very much in the idiom of Jesus' Jewish context, and there's something similar like this at Qumran, that each member of the community at Qumran, in the manual of discipline, there's a heavenly, there's an angel that is their guardian angel that is before the throne of God to protect them. And Jesus says this, you know, the, the meek Roy that in the community who are on the periphery, who in the strong sort of sort out there to the margins, you know, tell them, get out of the way. In heaven, their angels look right into the face of God. Okay. So there's a reversal of position. Okay. Uh, so the ones that the human community despises become uh, favored uh, within uh, the community of God. Their angels continually see the face of my Father in heaven. And then he tells the story of the lost sheep. In the Gospel of Luke, this occurs in chapter 15. The three great mercy parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And there it's told, if you remember the beginning of chapter 15 in Luke, uh, the religious authorities, the scribes and Pharisees are murmuring that he eats with sinners and associates with them. So to defend his ministry to sort of the outcast, the marginalized, Jesus tells these three parables. Uh, Matthew takes the same text and now puts it in as part of his ecclesial picture. The strong are to be like the shepherd who leave the 99 and go after the one who strays. And, and then it ends with this very strong uh, chapter, or verse 14. It is not the will of your Father in heaven that a single one of these little ones should be lost. Okay. So this opening section of chapter 18, I think, is addressed to the strong. And it speaks in very powerful tones that attentiveness to them, not despising them, going after them, when they go astray, that this is the, the quality, here's a quality of greatness within the, the, the kingdom of heaven. It starts off with this, uh, this text. So uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, interesting assertion here, pastoral care for the little ones, the vulnerable, those who go astray. And we can try to fill in the blanks of what was going on in Matthew's community. Who were these people? We don't know for sure but we can certainly connect it to our own experience. And then you have this segment about uh, handling disputes and the authority of the community to deal uh, with conflict in the community, uh, beginning in verse 15. 
Uh, now, this notion of, uh, you know, it's a very common sense notion. It's something probably most thoughtful people try to do anyway. You know, you go first if somebody, notice that the initiative here is on the part of the victim. Yeah. If uh, my brother or sister has something against me, uh, I go to the person, okay? And so it's not a matter of the person who perpetrates it having repentance and go and say, I'm sorry, I offended you. It's sort of the other way around. And that's the same thing that we see in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the, it's the victim that's expected to take the initiative. Uh, he's speaking to, to, to the communities, that, uh, to the members of the community who are alert uh, to the teaching of Jesus. And so this notion of, you know, if he doesn't listen uh, to you, go and get two witnesses. This is very Jewish. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, two witnesses for any kind of offense or crime. Again, it's in the Qumran manual of discipline to bring uh, two witnesses when you're dealing with a very difficult uh, personal circumstance. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the ecclesia. Here is the term church. Uh, we had it in chapter 16 with Peter, uh, you know, on, you are the rock on which I will build my church. And here, ecclesia is this assembly uh, that comes together in a very difficult situation. And then if he refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And of course, there's been a lot of, you know, discussion. This is something of a catch-22. I mean, it does foresee a kind of, uh, you have to remove someone from the community. Uh, they're, they're not listening to the church, but the notion of being like a tax collector and sinner, of course, you say, well, how does that work in Matthew's gospel? How does Jesus treat them? So they're, 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 they're removed from the community but they're not shunned okay? because now they become the object of another type of pastoral care as the tax collectors and the sinners whom we'll see in you know, chapter 20, the uh, story of the two sons. The tax collectors and sinners enter, the heaven before, <laughs> enter heaven before you. There's this kind of uh, concern and care for them. <clears throat> this is very important. I think I may have mentioned to you when we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount but just to retrieve it here, uh, I was referencing, if you recall, a, a comment of a, a, a woman professor from uh, St. Olaf's in a panel we were having at one of the meetings of the Society of Biblical Literature about the, some of the dynamics within the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> Excuse me, someone raised the question that, you know, all of the burdens on the injured party uh, the victim has all of the burden of initiating reconciliation and absorbing the violence, turning the other cheek. And she raised the question, what about justice? Or as some, actually somebody in the audience raised the question. And her response was to point to this text, okay. that while uh, Jesus does address the person injured, the community has responsibility to protect the victim. So the victim tries to do the right thing and goes to the perpetrator. But if the perpetrator will not listen, and therefore, in a sense, is still in the stance of serious enmity, then the community has to step in and deal with it. The community has to bring justice for the victim. And I think that's a genuine insight here. Uh, the community has uh, authority and has a responsibility uh, not to let a situation develop in which uh, enmity continues and is a threat to the one who has tried to initiate some form of reconciliation. And here, uh, linked on to this, it's so interesting, the authority of the community, in a sense, emerges in a situation of conflict. Uh, it's not like the blessing of Peter in chapter 16, uh, but uh, it, it's here to affirm in a difficult moment that the community has uh, power. Uh, truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And as in chapter 16, P 
Peter, who became historically very important about with Cornelius and you know, mediating the, the opening to the Gentiles. Uh, so that binding and loosing in Matthew, I think, primarily has to do with determining membership. It had other functions. This is rabbinic language, binding and loosing. It also had to do with certain doctrinal formulations. But here it has to do uh, with certainly with who belongs in the community and who is acting in a way that they're putting themselves outside the community. Not outside the community's care, but outside uh, the ability to function within the community. And so the, 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 uh, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. God will ratify uh, the decision of the community. And it's right here in 19 and 20, you know, the power of the community's uh, prayer is rooted ultimately in the presence of Jesus among them, verse 20. Uh, commentators uniformly see a connection between this verse 20 and the name Emmanuel, God with us. And the very last verse of Matthew's Gospel in chapter 28, verse 20, I will be with you always until the end of time. So the presence of the risen Christ within this community not unlike the sayings about the Shekinah, uh, about God's presence through the Torah. They, uh, the, the community gathered around the Torah. God is present there. Uh, and here for Matthew's community, uh, they're rallying around the presence of the risen Christ who confirms uh, the power of the community when it's used in this spirit. And then you do come to uh, this uh, final segment uh, and this is very remarkable. This uh, parable is unique to Matthew. It has no parallels in uh, Luke or uh, Mark or John, for that matter. And Peter, again, as we had seen earlier when we talked about Peter, uh, has this role so frequently in the Gospel of Matthew that he had with the taxation question at the end of chapter 17 and many other spots. He's sort of the the spokesperson uh, for them. And he comes forward and notice that the same pattern is here. If another member of the church sins against me, uh, the New Revised Standard, this is an example of, uh, what would you say, the strength and weakness of translation when you're dealing with inclusive language. Okay? Uh, the, uh, the, the term used throughout this uh, discourse is Adelphos, which is means brother. Okay. And uh, it's the, the male form. It's certainly like the generic man uh, is uh, implying a member of the community. But the New Revised Standard translates it as a member of the community. Okay. Uh, so you know, it, it achieves the inclusiveness that we want, but it also drops the familial terminology <laughs> that uh, is used here, adelphos, adelphe, uh, brother or sister. So it's, you know, you, you, you gain some things and you lose some others over time uh, to know that Jesus wasn't talking about membership. <laughs> you know, this is not a, like a voluntary association he's talking about. A, it's the new family that he mentioned uh, in uh, chapter 12, the end of chapter 12, the ones who do the will of God and keep it are brother and sister and uh, mother to me. So here again, it's someone else has injured me. And so how often, how many times must I exercise forgiveness and reconciliation? Uh, so again, it's the, the one who's been wounded, it's the victim. Uh, that is taking the burden of trying to initiate forgiveness, as we saw earlier in this chapter. And he says seven times, and we all know seven is one of these in, in gematria and Jewish numerology. Uh, seven is multiple times, infinity, seven times, 70 times. And that's what Jesus responds and said to him, not seven times, but I tell you 77 times. And people see this related to Genesis 4, 24, the Lamech's uh, blood vengeance uh, 
77 times, and here Jesus, uh, in Matthew's formulation, reverses that. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have, uh, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven, you know, the, uh, the parable introduced uh, in verse 23. <coughs> Excuse me. And, you know, it's, it's a very, uh, one of the things that characterizes often the parables that uh, are unique to Matthew have a certain, I would say, moralizing tone. Okay? They, they illustrate a moral principle. And a lot of people will think, well, these stories are, you know, we don't know what the kernel of them is. It may have been some other form of parable that Jesus is in the tradition of Jesus speaking. But I think Matthew has had a lot to do with the composition of this. It's very typical language of his, and it's a very typical motif. Uh, and, and in many ways, uh, if you remember, at the end of the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6, way back when, when we were looking at that, you have this sort of codicil added uh, to the end. Uh, it's in 6, 14, and 15. After having said the Lord's Prayer, then it, he adds, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Okay, so this parable is like an enactment of this. Okay. Uh, and of course, it's put in wonderful, exaggerated tones. Uh, people who study this kind of thing are, you know, are always speculating, what is a talent? How much is a talent? Okay. Some say 15 years, the average uh, craftsman's salary. Uh, 10,000 in the context of first century greco roman world was the largest figure. Now we have, what, millions and trillions, and what do we have beyond trillion? Is there such a thing? I don't know. But uh, they had 10,000. When they got to 10,000, you know, their minds exploded. They couldn't handle it anymore. And Josephus says the yearly tax return collection by Herod at the extent of his, Herod the Great, extent of his kingdom, was 10,000 talents in a year, okay, total. So, so you have to get that this is a huge sum. This is the national debt, you know, the guy is owing. And, and what's great, I'm sure that the audience would laugh at this, you know, because uh, he says he fell on his knees before him uh, after the, this, the master threatens, the king threatens him. He says, have patient with me, I will pay you everything. You know, he will, okay, so it's $40 billion. I can handle this. Just all I need is more time. That's what he asked for, more time. Just give me a little more time. It's like, you know, some of these mafia pictures you see, you know, about to break your knuckles. Oh, right, just give me a little more time and come back tomorrow, I'll pay for this. And, and then, of course, the disparity, uh, the whole point of the parable of the merciless servant, the same person who is forgiven this enormous debt, who didn't even ask for forgiveness, he asked for more time, you know, is uh, totally relieved and then goes out and throttles uh, this guy and asked him for a few denarii, a uh, hundred denarii, you know. So this is a, one of the smallest uh, denominations and, you know, it's a relatively insignificant uh, amount, but he is, you know, pay what you owe. And he refused and had him thrown into prison until he should pay the debt. And then this, when the fellow servants see this, it says they're saddened. Matthew uses the term, they're distressed, they're saddened. And of course you have the king come in and, and wreak uh, justice, vengeance on the man. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And then uh, verse 35, so my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So this, uh, you know, when you end up with this uh, discourse, uh, it's, it's such a remarkable focus on compassion, 
uh, attentiveness to the people that are vulnerable and on the margin, uh, a sense of humility, uh, not being arrogant and despising people that are you know, less powerful than you, uh, the call for limitless forgiveness, uh, a way of dealing with conflict that respects the perpetrator, but that nevertheless also uh, recognizes the responsibility of the community. It's a very mature Christian presentation here in this text. Please. We talked a lot about the meek boy, the little one. Yeah. In our culture today, in the U.S., for example, who might the meek boy be? What do you think? Take a crack at it. I mean, I yeah. suppose in racially it would be minorities. Sure. Economically poor. Sure. Yeah, I think, and it probably would depend on each community. Uh, you know, I'm thinking like in a parish community, if that's sort of a, something of an ecclesia here. Who are the vulnerable? I mean, the people that maybe they check in, uh, the people that are a bother, the people that don't contribute. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, I, I think in each case, we could think certainly what you're pointing out. I mean, I think this is what Pope Francis is really emphasizing, you know, reaching out to the vulnerable, whether they're, uh, you know, the immigrants. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's a very, it's vivid terms. In, in Jesus' day, we know in the gospel, he's talking about uh, many of the people who are ill, uh, people who are struggling to be in the community, uh, the people that are hungry, <laughs> you know, the multi, you know, so, so you can, I think it's one of these uh, texts that invites us to do exactly what you just did in your question. Who, is, who are the vulnerable for me? And I think it keeps changing. Uh, and then you can also say, who are the strong? You know, who are the macroi that whose inclination might be to be either indifferent to or to subtly despise the people that are different morally from this? I mean, it's, it's a... There's an examination of conscience going on here, I think, that's, uh, that's very powerful uh, in this text. Uh, and, you know, that's why I try to, to, if you just take a look, and I won't comment on each one of these, but I, I felt, you know, I was going back over our material that we've been looking at in Matthew's Gospel, especially in the light of this community discourse and uh, thinking, well, cumulatively, what if you tried, you know, just using the text of Matthew to define the Christian community? You know, what would be the uh, ecclesiology? You know? and, and, and so I, uh, you, you, you know, could, this could be formulated differently, but I tried to take some of the, the tones, particular emphasis of Matthew, uh, these would not all be exclusive to Matthew, but cumulatively, they're characteristic of his gospel. Certainly a community centered on Jesus as teacher and healer, and all these other titles of reverence, you know, very profound uh, faith in Jesus uh, as Lord, Son of God, Emmanuel, and therefore discipleship as following Jesus, you know, this very sort of baseline, fundamental stance of of the community. It's uh, enthralled with the person of Jesus and finds its meaning there. A community that anticipates and leads to the final consummation of history. This is something we'll see coming up, uh, especially in our next uh, set of texts as we move to the end of uh, you know, chapter 24 and 25. Matthew is very concerned about the destiny of the world and the destiny of the community. The end time looms large for him. Not so much in terms of its proximity and therefore a kind of panic to get things right, but, but sort of more like purpose. Where are we going? What, what defines us? Uh, what is our future? And what impact does it have on us now in the present if we see that this is our destiny? And then uh, the community that's in continuity with Israel, we've seen how constant that concern is, but it's also new and distinctive because of his faith in Jesus. We'll see that happen in the passion narrative and in the final scenes of the gospel. You know, the, there's a, a change of 
in history, the new age is emerging. And what were restraints before are not now, uh, particularly in terms of the mission. And then this we know, this greater righteousness, the term dikaiosune, or holiness, uh, chapter 5, your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. And then I just tried to, on the next page there, to, you know, what does that mean? Uh, tuned to doing the will of God, you know, as reflected in Jesus' own teaching. Uh, ethic rooted in the love command, presented as the heart of Jesus' teaching, and the principle for all law, and not putting heavy burdens on people. A community in which there is care and protection for the vulnerable, and profound commitment to mutual forgiveness. This is what we're looking at tonight in chapter 18. A community that avoids hypocrisy and its expressions of piety. You know, this keeps coming up, the hypocrites. There's something about this, you know. Uh, and, you know, I, I, again, I don't want to romanticize, but I think this is another one that the Pope has sort of touched people with authenticity, you know, eschewing some of the uh, frills uh, and, uh, you know, a more authentic expression. And then uh, another whole set, the, the missionary dimension of Matthew, extremely important, that, that fulfills the God-given destiny of Israel. So the mission to the world is not over against the mission to Israel, or it's not plan B, as we were saying, but it's a fulfillment of the God-given destiny of Israel, one committed to witness and proclamation, which proclaims to the world the teachings of Jesus. That's the final exhortation of the risen Christ. A missionary community that puts aside the burdens of possessions and reveres the radical itinerant lifestyle of Jesus himself. This is a, a question a lot of uh, discussion goes on about Matthew's gospel. You know, the Son of Man, nowhere to lay his head, leaving behind, uh, like the invitation of the rich young man that we'll see in chapter 19. Saw your possessions, come follow me. That, that in the community of Matthew, there seems to be a reverence still for this kind of radical, itinerant uh, missionary activity. Uh, you see it in chapter 10. You know, don't take a lot of baggage. Uh, don't take an extra tunic and so on. It's a sort of mobile, uh, certain radicality to it, a uh, certain dependence on the community and the, the people they go to for their sustenance. And we'll see also in a way of interpreting next week when we look at the sheep and the goats, I think has to do with the missionaries, how people treat the missionaries, that uh, is, is really a concern to Matthew. Uh, uh, also, a, a fearless community that's convinced the spirit which animated Jesus now speaks through them. We had that in chapter 10. Don't be afraid about what you're going to say at that moment because the spirit of God is with you and will speak uh, for you. And yet, at the same time, we've seen this uh, a vulnerable and at times weak community. There's not an idealization going on. Uh, Peter, you know, says this can happen to you, and Jesus calls him stumbling rock. You're a stumbling rock. You're Satan to me. Uh, we'll see in the Passion story of Matthew. We heard on Palm Sunday the uh, the failure of the disciples: betrayal, denial, desertion. Uh, uh, the uh, little faith, the term uh, oligopistoi that Matthew uses. So it's a vulnerable and at times weak community. Why did you hesitate, uh, as he says to Peter walking on the water, and it will be said at the final scene of the gospel, beset by fear and division. You know, the, again, uh, we'll see this in chapter 24, uh, the predictions of what's going to happen as the world's history unfolds. Uh, we saw already in chapter 10. And then a community that anticipates that being faithful to its mission, it will suffer as Jesus himself did. This comes up in so many texts here. Uh, what they do to the master, they will do to you. Uh, so the, the, the cost of witness and proclamation of the commands of Jesus lead to opposition, persecution, even death. And then a, a community that respects its leadership. I think this is one of the features of Matthew, much more evident than you have in the other Gospels. Uh, John's Gospel, in a sense, you know, the beloved disciple sort of eclipses Peter in a way. Uh, 
but in Matthew, there is, even though Peter is very human and frail in many ways, yet there's uh, chapter 16, uh, all of this uh, spokesperson uh, roles that he plays. Uh, so, and also the, the scribe trained for the kingdom of heaven. And we have a text that comes again uh, in verse, uh, in chapter 23 at the end, I will send you scribes and wise people, you know, to lead you. Uh, and, and, and so there's, I think, within Matthew's community, it rises to the surface, there is a concern for the leadership of the community. And it also, at the same time, has the strong egalitarian ethos we were talking about. Uh, you know, call no one on earth your father, call no one on earth your leader, call, don't be called rabbi, avoid titles of honor. And then on the other hand, in chapter 20, authority is service. It's contrasted, it's already in Mark's text, contrasted with the way the macroi, the great ones, exercise authority among the Gentiles, the imperial authority. It contrasts the authority exercised in the Christian community with an authority that represses, uh, that uh, constrains and demeans uh, people. Uh, so it, but it's concerned about authority and also respects the authority of the community as a whole, as we saw just in the text we're looking at, binding and loosing. At a certain point, the community asserts itself, uh, particularly in some critical moments. And then finally, a community confident in its future because the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is the words of Jesus to Peter in chapter 16. And then this other motif that we saw some evidence of uh, in the uh, community discourse, the, the I am with you, you know, Emmanuel, God with us, as Matthew interprets the term, the name given to Jesus. And at the end, I am with you uh, all days until the end of the world, to the end of time. So uh, the, this community, uh, you know, there's sort of, sides of it that are weak and fragile, uh, divided, uh, but there's also uh, an undercurrent of, of strength and confidence uh, that uh, God is with them. Uh, so anyway, this is, I don't know, uh, this is a way to try to sort of do a little word <laughs> portrait of the Christian community here. And I doubt if any one of these are like a surprise to us, you know. But it's the accumulation of them, I think, that's very, very powerful. Uh, and uh, I don't know if people have any reactions, comments, protests, murmurs about these. <laughs> it's all part of the scene. But uh, please. They, oh, okay, no, what, what the word, uh, the Greek word, ekklesia, that's being used here. Uh, is used in the, the Septuagint to translate the word kahal. And, and that means basically the assembly. So the assembly of Israel, okay. The uh, Islam speaks of the Ummah, you know. It's, it's the formally assembled community. Uh, so Matthew is using a term that is really in continuity with Judaism. Uh, you know, in Anglo-Saxon, we use, uh, the, the Romance languages use eglise, which comes out of this, but of course Anglo-Saxon goes in a different way, kirka and, and church, I'm not sure of all the you know, etymological changes. So uh, whether Matthew, at this point, I don't think the term itself is meant to contrast with synagogue. Uh, it's, it's really in continuity with the notion of Israel gathering as a people, formerly gathering. Synagogue was like a say a, a setting or a medium in which it could happen, just like a church 
as a building, as a place where it could happen. But what is happening is the bringing together of the people. And that, that assembly of people has authority. And what we don't know is, and this is probably part of your question, Peggy, we don't know what did this assembly look like? You know, it seems to be a local assembly that Matthew is thinking of in chapter, you know, because you assemble. Is it everybody, you know, or is it the community of which this conflict, in which this conflict is taking place? So it partakes of the larger ecclesia. Uh, so is this making sense? What, what you know, so there, there's real continuity here with, with Jewish concept of the gathering of the people of God, as you have in the Exodus story, or as you have in Ezra and Nehemiah, the assembly of the people coming to hear the word when they come back from exile and so on. Uh, so it has a sense of a community, uh, but a community with identity and purpose. And uh, so that, I think, is what he's doing. Later, of course, there will be these distinctions of church and synagogue, but I think you know, Matthew uses the interesting term, their synagogues. Okay. You know, so we have our synagogues where the Christian Jews that follow Jesus gather and they have their synagogues. But I think Matthew is saying that the assembly of the people who believe in Jesus, of the Jews who believe in Jesus, is in full continuity with the assembly of Israel and in a sense is the rightful inheritor. I mean, this has been the struggle all along in this gospel, you know, that so that they, they are just as the people Israel gathered, uh, so uh, the Christian community gathers as the ecclesia. Okay? And if he were writing in Hebrew, he would say, we're the kahal, you know, we are the, the, uh, the community. So it's uh, all the way through in Matthew, we have the kind of question you've posed is like, you know, where, where's the taproot of this, these concepts? And I think for Matthew, they're constantly uh, drawn from Israel. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's not, I don't think he would, would say that Jesus came to found a church. <laughs> It was already there. <laughs> he came to reconstitute it, to bring it to its destiny, uh, to complete it. But there was not like starting something new. There is something new, but it's not new in that sense. <laughs> but that makes any sense at all. You know what I mean? Like it's in. It's a new moment for it. It's a new age. It's a. Uh, it's a lifting up of something that was already there, and, and you. You had it in, you have heard it said, but I say to you, you know, this, we've had this constant uh, reference to the way things were, the old and now the new, <laughs> but not in the sense of radical rupture, you know, of continuity and uh, uh, renewal and fulfillment. So. But it's, it's very, uh, what we, I, I think it's, it's a challenge for the church, when I think it is coming to grips with, uh, is is to understand this kind of radical continuity with Judaism, yeah. from the point of view of the early Christians. The Jewish people would see it different. Yeah. Uh, they don't have to feel continuity <laughs> with <laughs> with Christianity, but for us, it, so that's why it's an asymmetrical relationship. You know, uh, they have no obligations to, in a sense. <coughs> see their future destiny in Christianity. Uh, but Christians do have a responsibility to see our roots within Judaism because of our own claims, our own sense of who Jesus was and what the, our faith is. So it works differently for both sides. Okay, everybody doing all right? Ready for your uh, Holy Week? Uh, and you know, next time we I'll again will be posted on the the, uh, the website. But we're going to be moving into uh, the completion of the uh, this apocalyptic segment of the gospel, all up through 
chapter 25, uh, which has to do with judgment, which has to do with what is our stance in the end time. Uh, and then beyond that, we enter into Jerusalem. We finally get to Jerusalem uh, and uh, on into the final conflicts and the passion story. So we're, we're picking up steam here as we, as we trot the road. So, so thank you all. Safe home, everybody, and a very happy Easter to everybody.